Hi there, this is Groovy and G, and welcome back to my channel. So the focus of my next few tutorials is going to be a complete breakdown of drum breaks and the processing of them, the production of them, layering breaks, just everything I know about drum breaks, specifically focusing on drum and bass and old school jungle style drum and bass, but I think this hopefully will have lots of good information in for anyone who's making breakbeat or any kind of drum break focused music. So I think a good place to start with projects is actually referencing songs which you like and I use Audio Finder for all of my sample managing. Whenever I hear a drum and bass song that I like or I like the drums of, I will just take a little snippet of that song and chuck it in here so I can always come back and listen to these drums that I really like. And I have this old school drum and bass song by Earl Grey. So it's a super cool break. It's a little bit slower than modern day jungle, but I think it's a cool place to start. And we're just gonna use this as a reference point and build from there. It might morph into something completely different, but this is just the point I'm gonna start from. So the first task here actually is to go and slice up this reference track into all the individual hits. Now this is a bit of a tedious process, but it will benefit us later on. I'm gonna focus mainly on the kicks and snares, but also try and get the hats and things like that in as well. So I'm gonna speed this bit up and just race through this very quickly. Now I've got my reference track all sliced up and I've rendered it to a phrase. What we've got to do is copy this phrase to the pattern editor. So we've got to make note of the number of lines in this phrase and the lines per beat value in this phrase. We've got to copy this 512 value into, into here. And then we can actually paste our sample, but you see the delay values haven't come in. So we've got to open this delay column and then paste it again. And then the delay values will come in. And we've also got to now set our lines per beat value to be 16. Now I like to work at four lines per beat, which means that each line is a 16th note. And so I don't really want my whole song to be going at lines per beat 16. So what you can actually do is use this command, which is the ZL command, I think. ZL and then 16 in hexadecimal is 10. So ZL10, and you see, if you look up here, when I play this, pattern now it jumps to 16 and what I can do is come to uh, my pattern where I'm going to start my song and go back to four and then once again it's going to trigger back to four lines per beat we can actually have the resolution correct for our reference track so it plays nicely and I've got to turn off the phrase editor as well so let's do that We've got our BPM wrong, and I'm going to speed up my BPM to the sounds right. I think it was somewhere around... It's somewhere around 54 to 56, maybe. The reason I've done all, all of this, all of the slicing of the reference track and putting it in the pattern, so now whenever I want to see a hit, I can actually go and find the hits and I can just press enter and I can see what all the hits are. And if I use the, the hotkey, which is jump to next note data, I've mapped this to my numpad now, but I think it's command shift page up and down. What you can do is actually just jump to these notes and just press enter and trigger them. And in this way, I can see all the different parts of this pattern, what's being triggered. Now to take this a step further, I'm going to copy this track. If I press Alt T, it's going to select the whole track. And then if I go to the top, I can copy it. I'm going to come down to my window and I'm going to make this 512. So now what I want to do is actually shrink this pattern. And at the moment it's going at 16 lines per beat. And so if I shrink it once, it'll be going at eight. And if I shrink it again, it'll be going at four. And what this has been, even though it sounds a little bit glitchy, I've now got this reference track running at the correct 
lines per beat value as my song is. And so I can now come and clearly see that's a kick, that's a snare. That sounds like another kick there. And so I can start to build my song around this framework and match up the kicks and the snares. I'm really a big believer in separating like-minded tasks from one another and people often talk about this with samples and in the past I've, I've never really listened to them that much and often made my projects and gone back and found samples but nowadays I really love creating a playlist of all the sounds I'm going to need for a project and then I don't need to go and look for any more samples at all really apart from maybe a few individual things and here I've just got a playlist, I've got my reference tracks at the top and then I've got all the elements that I think I will need for a drum and bass track. Kick drums at the start, some snares, snaps, rims, uh, clap, I've got some bongos, hats, and then lots of different types of hats, open hats, closed hats, rides, tambourines, cymbals, shakers, um, bongos and congos, I've got some foley stuff, and then lots and lots of drum breaks. And that's kind of it. Okay, so when you've, you've got your reference track and we've got all the sounds we need to do this drum break, what your decision then is, I think, is if you're gonna build your drums around a core drum break, so go and find a, a old school drum break from somewhere, maybe it's a typical one, like the assembly break that people often use in drum and bass, or funky drummer or a break like that, or to build your core of your drums around one-shot samples. You get a slightly different flavor from doing both of these. Building around a drum break, you'll get a more raw sound, a more old school sound, and building around one-shots, you often get a cleaner sound and it can be more punchy and modern. But it also depends what you do down the line. But just as a base starting point, I think your first decision is, do I go for one-shot kick and snare samples or do I go for a drum break and start to build around that? Now, because we're in Renoise and we're going for a slightly old school sound anyway, just by using this door, I'm going to start my track with a drum break. And I've collected a few drum breaks here. I've got maybe two core breaks that I really like here, which is... I think I'm going to layer this one underneath the kicks and snares of this track, and that's going to be the foundation of my groove. Okay, so now we've found the break that we want to use for our song, we've got to figure out a way to warp it to a drum and bass speed. Now, even though this BPM is a little bit slower than modern drum and bass, it's a lot quicker than this, this drum break is rolling. And I probably don't need this whole break as well, so just to save myself time slicing up, I'm going to put in a slice marker, I hold command, and then I can double click, and it will select the whole area, the other side of the slice marker, and then I can just delete that away. Now, I've got a slightly smaller break to work with, so the easiest way to warp a break to your song tempo is actually to use the beat sync in Renoise and this will just pitch up the samples. So if I, that's knocked down the right value, if I go down to 32 maybe, that's now pitched it up to the speed of my BPM using beat sync. If I hit this little T, it's going to show me it's pitched up by four semitones and 44 fine tune and I can then turn beat sync off. Now, if I put slice markers in here, I can then start to trigger these sounds and they'll all be pitched up and you see the transpose value has come in. If I, for some reason, have put slice markers in already before I've thought about time stretching it and then I hit this beat sync, what we're gonna have is this top break is going to be running at the beat sync value. But the other hits are still pitched down. And so to the way to get around this is to actually commit to the beat sync. And then you can copy the transpose and fine tune values to all the other hits. If I select them all and just copy them in. I think the fine tune was 44. Now all my hits are going to be at the correct pitch value to warp to my song tempo. The second method for warping a break to your song tempo is the gate to tempo method and to do this you put slice markers in all the hits and now what I've got to do is right click and I go slices 
render slices to phrase and I want to be on lines for beat 16. So render slices to phrase and it's exported those slices to the phrase and now because my BPM is running at 155, this phrase is matching my BPM in its cycle and therefore the drum break is now playing at my song tempo. Now I can trigger this phrase sample again and then I can actually right click and render that to a sample. Now the last way to warp a break to your tempo is actually to use a granular time stretching effect. And I've made a template which is on my website which I'll link below. But I have this instrument and renoise and I've called it time stretch effects 2. And I can essentially just take a drum break like this one. I don't need to have any slice markers and I can just drag it in here and swap it out. Now what's happening in this instrument is I've mapped out this phrase editor to keep triggering the phrase and then to trigger it at different slice markers along the length of the phrase. So it's re-triggering it loads and loads of times at very small increments and that's how you're warping it to your song tempo. Okay, so now I've got my three different breaks. I did make a mistake when I was rendering this break before. I didn't take the transpose values off when I did the gate to tempo technique. So you've got to make sure that you're just rendering the break at its original pitch. But anyway, I've got the three breaks here and I'll play them for you now so you can hear the differences in all these techniques. I think they're actually all very viable options. Here's the gate to tempo technique. Here's the pitch break. And here's the time stretch effects break. Now the pitch break obviously sounds completely different, but if I was gonna say any difference between the gate to tempo and the time stretch, I think the gate to tempo just preserves the transients and it, it sounds the most authentic because all, you, all you're really doing in the gate to tempo is just cutting off the tails of all these samples to make them fit together. So the hits actually stay the same. And for that reason, I really like using the gate to tempo method if I really wanna preserve the punchy kicks and snares of a sample. So for this track, I'm going to use this gate to tempo method for getting this drum break to my project tempo. Cool. So all the slice markers in and now I can take the elements that I want out of this main drum break. So let's just get the track going now. And I'm going to call this one kick and I'm going to call this one snare. And I'm just going to color this blue and then I'm going to hold alt and drag the kick into the snare. And then we're going to call this drum bus. So I'm just doing a bit of organization right at the start. Now I'm going to put my kick and snares on different channels just because I know I'm going to want to process them differently later on. And this is just a bit of housekeeping in the beginning. What I'm going to do now is the reason I created this reference track and warped it to my song tempo is I can listen. So I know there's a snare here. Oh, that's got me on as well. So it's got another kick coming, I would say here, even though it's it's on this column, it's delayed quite a lot, and so I think that's where it's coming onto here. There. Dun, 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 dun. There, there. Right, so I've got my kick snare pattern now, and this is an eight bar pattern, and I've just referenced this track, and I've gone through, and whenever I've heard a kick or a snare, in this track, I've put one in one of my kick snare columns that I've created. Now, I've got a couple of things that I'm focusing on here. One is that my kick sample has a some high pitched like a hat in it and I don't really want that. So I'm going to come to this break and try and find that's a good kick. Maybe that's a slightly better kick there. And I might use that kick instead of my kick there so let's go and go and program in this is one two three. what i'm going to do is select this whole kick track and just pitch it up until i find that i'm also finding that this snare is ringing out quite a lot and what i want to do actually is just gate this snare sample so i can 
I know this is my snare, I can create a new modulation lane and then assign this snare to this modulation lane. Let's call that snare. And then I can assign an envelope and I can pull everything in and then just choose the decay. And I quite like that amount of decay for a slightly more snappy drum and bass style snare. If I listen to my reference track um, here, So obviously you've got a lot more high information in that snare than mine. Mine's a bit of a lower snare and it could even be a bit snappier when listening to that. So with drum and bass, in order to get your drums tight, often pulling in the decay and making them more snappy is a good way to go about it. I think I might want to do the same for my kick. So let's create another lane and call this kick. I need to assign the kick to this lane and then I can actually just alt click down here, copy that envelope and drag it in here. Okay, so now I've got the core of my pattern down. I could have used one shots to make those kicks and snares, but I think that they, I found a good break with punchy, clear kick and snare samples in, and I've now just warped them to my project a little bit. The next step I wanna talk about is actually drum layering. You could make a whole tutorial on drum laying hours and hours long in itself. And it's actually a very experimental thing to do in music. There's no right or wrong method for it. You really sometimes just have to keep persevering in order to get good results. But one thing that generally works very well for me is to layer a snare with white noise. This snare, I'm gonna go to my sample library and And these are really good for laying with a snare. So I think this one will be good. And I'm going to bring this into my project. Let's just listen to this as it is. So if I get the levels right and pull this down a bit. You can hear it's ringing out too long. So what I might do is just go to this envelope and copy it to this, this white noise sample. And that's already sounding pretty good to me. It's just giving it a lot more high frequency. I think one thing I might do is firstly cut the unnecessary lows away from this. And I might even lower it a little bit more in level. Let's turn it to go to the bottom and then bring it in. And it's just given a bit more weight to the snare drum and a bit more high end. The snare was sounding a bit dead before and now it's got a little bit more life. So good thing to layer your snare with is um, white noise. And with your kick, this kick is actually sounding okay. What I might do is just filter it and also drive it a little. It's just sounding a little bit too subby and we want to make some room for our bass in drum and bass. So you, you, you rarely have a super subby kick drum like you do in house music. Usually you roll off some of that super low energy in your kick to make room for the bass. I've got this kick drum, but if I was going to layer a kick drum, I would usually go to very simple drum machine samples. I have, um, if I go to drum machine here at the top, I have say, that's a good punchy 909 sample. And if I layer this kick drum with a sample, what I could actually do to save myself time is select this whole track and copy it to this new channel. I could then select all of these notes and I could map. I need to go from instrument four to instrument six. So I'm going from the, the gate to tempo, which has got my kick in to this new instrument and I could hit swap. So that's now moved this instrument to number six and then I could actually just pitch them back down to C4. And that's now triggering this punchy kick. With layering, one of the most important things is phase. So you often want to check the phase of these samples. 
you can do things like add some delay in this kick column. And you can see as soon as I start changing the phase, it completely changes how the sound is working. Especially when I'm uh, layering breaks, I'll often come and move around slice markers very subtly on individual hits and just see how the phase, you know, even moving a tiny amount like this amount will make a big difference to the... If I start moving around this hit a little bit, That sounds a little bit nicer to me there than where I had it before. So phase aligning is very important when layering and you can either do this using, using the delay column for your track or I think it's a bit easier and you definitely have a lot more control coming in moving slice markers around. Yes, one thing you can actually do is if you haven't got any space like I do in this kick track, I can copy a section of it and I can paste it at the beginning and then I can actually just silence this area and I can put a marker in. Now I've got to go and trigger this whole thing an octave below to make it work. So now I'm just triggering the slice of the kick rather than the whole instrument. So you've got to pitch it down an octave and then pitch it up one semitone to hit that slice. And I can then move this around. So that's giving me a lot more sub there in my kick. Moving it forwards. So you can get very different tones by moving around where the sample start is and manipulating the phase of the two samples you're layering. I actually just quite like it where it is. I think it's fine. And what I will do is kind of sculpt this a little bit. I think this has got quite a good snap and maybe I just want to take the very, very start of this sample uh, and just have it as a sort of click at the start. Definitely got too much low in there. So it's thickened it up a little bit. One, another thing you can do is put a pitch envelope on a sample if I go and put an envelope on the pitch of this kick. I can actually just delete that one. You can use a pitch envelope to give it more punch to the sample and you can bring up this uh, pitch range if I put it say 48. It's giving me a much more tonal attack to the sound. So actually playing around with this pitch envelope, I found something I quite like, which is just a very subtle pitch envelope. And it's just making the kick a bit punchier and a bit brighter. So we've got the core of our drums done, done now with the kick and the snare and we've layered it. And I'm gonna start adding some percussion now and that's really gonna start bringing everything to life. So what I've done there is I've actually just selected a whole bunch of samples and dragged them onto a track and it's created a sample instrument where I can now trigger these samples all on one track. Oh, the 16th note. So on all the on beats. And maybe let's try another one. Oh, I quite like this one. Cool. So with hats, a really good place to start is actually just using simple velocities. A very good one is to kind of go every other 6868. Eight, six, eight. So you're putting F emphasis on every other beat. Another one that I really like to do is to go low, medium, high, medium, low, medium, high, like that. And you're really just trying to create a groove of velocities. There's so many ways you can do your velocity on hats, but just something that's rolling around um, is always nice. You can actually do this thing in Renoise where if I go selection, I can humanize everything and that's going to slightly change all the velocities as well. So that's quite a good thing to do once you set up your initial velocities is to add a little bit of randomness to it. 
cool. I quite like that. I might want to turn it up a little bit in gain. We're also just going to filter out the super lows here. So while I'm on the hats, I just want to show you a couple of techniques which are really useful and I use all the time. And what we're going to do is come into the modulation panel and the modulation panel in Renoise, whenever you trigger a note, it will trigger your ADSR, your envelope, your LFO. So if I put an LFO on, you can see it just keeps triggering and triggering over and over again. If you want to put a free envelope or a free LFO on a sample, you have to do this trick where you assign. And if I do this, for instance, for pitch, if I assign pitch to a macro, pitch, I can then come to my window and I can type in instrument macros. And I've now got pitch here and I can manipulate pitch for this instrument. So I can then assign a free LFO and assign this to instrument macros and assign it to pitch. So now I have an LFO modulating pitch. And it's obviously doing it quite a lot there, but if I pull this right down, And I find this is quite a good way to figure out different pitches for percussion. It's just to not do it by semitones and just to do it by ear using using this method of, of um, having a very low frequency and a very low amplitude and then finding a pitch range just very subtly modulate around. Now, before I was showing you, if I go back to this modulation panel, I was showing you how you can map parameters to your instrument macros and then you can modulate them in this main window but actually if you use this LFO and if I do this to something say I get decimator which is a bit crushing effect and I want the bit depth to be off but I want to actually modulate this this frequency of the bit crusher what I can do is assign an LFO but if I put this random LFO on it's going to work freely and randomly modulate. So if I turn, say, the amplitude down a lot, one thing that's maybe happening with the pitch is it's modulating too much. So if I come back up to pitch, you see the pitch range here I've got set as 12 semitones, but I can pull that down. And so now it's just going to modulate a very small amount over a semitone. And that's just going to give you a much more subtle effect but it's still going to give you some of that humanization and randomness which is getting you away from this computer generated sound of music so another thing that's very good to do this too i can now copy this random lfo and i can just put that on volume so volume is now also going to randomly modulate in the way that we're we're humanizing the selection we can actually just do that in a slightly more organic way by modulating the volume LFO in this modulation panel. Another thing to do with the hi-hats now is to actually come and start accenting some of these hits. In this instrument, I've got maybe this hat. Uh, and let's go and maybe do one here. Maybe one there. Cool, and I like that rhythm. This particular hat is also because I've got this modulation set up, it's being affected by all the stuff that the other hat was, but maybe I don't want that. So I can create a new modulation lane and assign this to the other modulation lane. And I can maybe go and pull in Let's go and do another trick that I like to do is actually to put a filter on and an LFO and then assign the LFO to the filter cutoff. So it's a very common modulation trick, this one. But if I go for a super slow amplitude again and put it really high. Just give me some more very subtle variations in all the hi-hat hits. And so I, I don't really have to go and change the velocities of these hits because I've got this filter just doing a little bit of movement for me, making it so that every hit doesn't sound exactly the same as the one before. And that's really the goal. It's just to have these subtle variations in all the hits. Cool. So this one 
has some definitely some more percussion I think just layered in and thickening up the sound a bit so we're going to go and add you could add more hi-hat layers here but I'm going to go and maybe add a, a tambourine or a ride that sounds really nice I think to add this ride might be really good maybe a shaker when have I pitched this one up That could be good. Let's go and just chop up a few of these shaker hits here. A good way to pitch up a whole instrument is just come up here and pitch it up here. And maybe we want to just gate this one as well. So I'm trying to save time by just copying around those bits of... Listen to the hats with the shaker in it. So by putting the shake in there, I'm just thickening up the sound of the hat a little bit and it's giving it more variety on each of the hits as you've got the shaker doing other things underneath the hat. Then finally, I quite want to get some kind of a different tone. One of these tambourines will be good. Maybe this one. And then what I can do is maybe I want to copy these velocities. So I'm pressing Alt and Z and I can just copy the volume column and then I can paste the volumes in there. I've just got a very steady groove there, but I think now is a good time to maybe layer on up some more drum breaks and to just give a bit more life to this whole thing. It's just standing a bit static and everything's just a bit kind of straightforward at the moment. And I think laying a drum break is a really good way of, of breathing some, some more life into a groove. So I found this one earlier. Maybe we just pitch this to the song tempo. Oh, 16. Ah, so you see, it, it wasn't a perfect loop, and so I was having problems with getting this beat sync to work. Um, but if I take off that last kick, so maybe back to 16. I like that sound of that shuffle that's happening there. Don't necessarily need the kicks that much, so let's filter out some of the kicks maybe. It's got, what else has it got happening in it? I don't know if I need that snare in it either. I, I really just like the shuffly bit. I could go, actually just mute the sample. One thing you can do is just use the volume in the volume column and you can mute certain parts of the sample and then you can bring it up where you like it. So here, maybe just this little. And I sort of want to just repeat that actually. So what I might end up doing is rendering this to a sample. And now I just have the little groove and I can just extract this. Ah, let's go and put some more markers in. So I've got that nice drum and bass shuffle now and I've just extracted it from this track. I could have just put in markers here, but I just, for whatever reason, found it easier to come and render it out and to just extract that little shuffly bit that I wanted. Okay, so... Very common one is to have another little shuffle at the end here. This one could be very good and it's slightly muted. So let's do this and I can show you another good trick here. 16. Well, I just want that groove again. Uh, so let's put these markers in. Nice, it's just thickening it up a little bit. Uh huh. So what, what I actually wanted to show you was if I come to a new instrument and I go to my instruments here, I have this drums, drum break, uh, 
have this Amen for Groove template. And this is just an Amen break, which I've sliced up, but I've been quite careful to come and put the points exactly where I want them. And then I've rendered it to a phrase, but what I can do is copy this phrase. If I, if I make sure I turn this phrase editor off, copy the phrase and come to my window and just paste it in. I've got to make sure I have the delay column open. I just solo this. Oh, it's the one of the reasons is that I'm, as I'm not choosing the instrument to send it to because I've just copied from a phrase. It's not actually told Renoise what instrument to send it to. So if I put a 10 in that column, select that, Command C, Command P to paste continuously. It's now going to trigger correctly, but it's too slow. So Alt track and shrink it. Now the reason I've done this is not because I want that choppy Amen sound, but I can see the delay values of the Amen groove here. And this is the, the Amen shuffle. And I can just take the, that groove. And uh, if I open the delay column on my own track, I can then paste in the Amen groove. So I can now kind of use the Amen as a groove template. And if I maybe trigger this one uh, at the same time and this one at the same time. So it's sounding a bit weird because I'm trying to align it with this other shuffle if I play these two at the same time. So I'm using the nudge tool now and that's sounding quite good. I've taken the Amen groove, but then I wasn't really working my track, but I've kept the, the way the Amen has separated the notes, but I've I've kind of moved them to fit with my song more using the nudge tool. And I could just try and layer and see what happens. Maybe we take that Amen and pull in uh, the decay. And I've obviously got to then match it with my groove here as well. So let's try and do that. Sounds quite cool. I think if a low level, it might just add a little bit. So let's have that going at low level and let's make sure we copy these things down. I don't need that delay value. Nice, these are a bit too loud uh, and I might want to just take off some of the top end as well. So I'm going to band pass these. No, I'm not. I think there's too much low going on as well. So I'm going to do a kind of. Let's try layering in some more breaks and see how we get along. This one's got a lot of rise and a lot of vibe in the break. And then that could be cool to sit under my one. So let's go and try this one. So this, this drum break I'm laying really th is thickening up the sound of the, the whole vibe and the break as a whole. I just want to um, EQ this a little bit. Okay, a bit of a resonance here. Get rid of that. One thing that can be good with layering breaks is to actually compress them a bit and so their levels aren't jumping around so much and they and then they can sometimes just sit a bit better under the mix. So not a crazy amount. You can hear how just putting that break underneath and I've just copied all the kicks and snares of my original break. really is just giving a lot of life to, and I'm, I'm rolling off the lows a bit as well. It's making the snare hit a bit harder and it's just bringing everything together with a sort of layer underneath everything. So I maybe want to layer one more break. A way to clean this hot pants break up, because I have on this break, I haven't actually I'm just triggering this kick and snare and I haven't put slices at all the individual shuffles. I can actually use something called a transient shaper to do what I was doing before with the decay and I can pull in the sustain. Just 
just a little bit and it just tightens the whole thing up a bit and makes it sound less sloppy underneath. Quite low in the mix. So if I if I show you these two breaks I've now layered with with or without. It doesn't make a huge difference to the sound and that's happening, but they are just layers in there which seem to thicken everything up. And that's one of the keys to getting this grooving, rolling, jungle style drums is to have these elements quite low in the mix that are just thickening up your sound a little bit. OK, so we've now added a few breaks and I think it's about time to start adding some of those nice shuffly snares that we can hear in the reference track here. Let's go to our main area where we have our kicks and snares. That might be good because it's quite a um, quite high pitched, maybe. Uh, it's got more than that, hasn't it? Maybe one more there. Mhm. Mm How's that one go? So I'm just messing around with this. I've pitched it around a bit and I've messed around with the groove. I haven't exactly followed what was happening in the sample. I just took inspiration from it. The snares in this original track are definitely taken from the original snare and they're just lower in level and they sound super cool there. I'm sure there's some swing and some groove on those snares and ours are just a bit straight at the moment. Even though I've got the velocities happening, I think they could do with a bit of swing and so I think this might be a good moment to just talk about swing and groove in Renoise and just go over some of the basics. Okay so I've made this groove swing cheat sheet and I put this on Reddit yesterday but I've just made this to give people a little tool that they can use when thinking about swing in Renoise and so I'm a, a Logic X user and these are my favorite Logic X swing values that are built into the program. They're the default ones that you can, you can use. And I've mapped them out. I've rewired Renoise into Logic and mapped out how all of these delay values add up. And really, this is just to show you, I think any value between sort of 16D to 16B, so it, between 15 and 40 in Renoise, will be a very good area to hit for swing. It took me so long to understand this and it's actually really simple. When we talk about swing in, in lots of these programs, what we're really meaning is we're swinging the off beats. So in Renoise, this would mean that uh, every other beat would be getting swung. So if I was gonna swing a note, I would generally leave the, th the things that are on beat or on the even numbers, I would leave them where they are and I would swing the off beat ones later. So if I pull up this again, I know that 2B is my favorite swing in Logic. So if I go and add a 2B here, and you get this really nice, satisfying swing. That sounds really robotic, but with that 2B, it's actually a really good value to use. And so swing, as we talk about it in the musical sense, is often just about swinging or delaying the offbeat values. I think it gets confusing because people talk about hip hop and Jay Dilla and swinging drums and it is that sound we hear, we, we think of it as being swung, but actually with that sort of music, everything's offbeat, nothing's aligning to a grid. And it's a little bit different from the swing templates that we're using indoors. So the point I really wanna make here, and I don't wanna make it too confusing about swing, is that you wanna be focusing on the offbeats. There are definitely times when you'll do what I did earlier and you're just taking the groove of an original Amen and all the notes will be swinging on, off, on and off beats. But a lot of time it sounds quite good to have this push and pull between delaying the off beats and then having your on beats on the correct notes. One reason for this is because generally we're making drum and bass. We have our kicks and snares dead on the grid. You can delay your snares a little bit and you can have some very subtle movement between each note. 
and some humanization but you don't want to go too crazy because when a dj goes to play your song in the club if your kicks and snares are always aligning at slightly weird values it's going to sound super weird whenever they're mixing tracks into them sounds way cooler maybe i want to go and have this delay a little bit more so maybe i go and put a 40 in and a 14 down there potentially maybe not maybe this one wants to come in so my groove there compared to the one i've got these delay values in is sounding much cooler having this this bit of delay and i've just used the cheat sheet as a template to kind of work in between sort of this area between 15 and 55 i think is a good place to start so the focus of this tutorial was actually just about getting the core of your drum breaks down about finding good reference tracks and using bits of modulation and little bits of processing in the production stage in the next tutorial i'm actually going to focus on expanding this drum break i'm going to talk about adding layers such as rides and textures and, and percussion and one-off effects and really building it so it's an interesting drum break over a longer passage. I really want to take you through how to how to make your drums interesting over the course of a whole track but I think this is a good point to leave today on. I look forward to bringing you the next part of my drum break series hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, but that's all for me today. Peace.